So good morning, everybody. Welcome to part two of the Easy Build tutorial. Um, let me make this a bit bigger to start. Um, so this is part two. Part one was two weeks ago and was recorded. So that recording is available through the Easy Build YouTube channel, um, which I think I shared in the chat yesterday. So if people want to get back to that, it's there. Today's session is also being recorded. The next session, which was originally planned for tomorrow, has been moved to next week um, to give, partially to give me a bit more time to prepare. Um, and if there's any suggestions there for specific topics, they are still welcome. Um, so in here, there's an overview of things I plan to cover. Um, so these four, I will probably cover together with um, the GitHub integration that EasyBuild has so to show how you can contribute back to EasyBuild quite easily. But if there's additional suggestions for topics, um, do let me know and I'll make sure to prepare some uh, content for that. Today, we're gonna do part two, uh, which is gonna be about troubleshooting, creating easy config files and implementing easy blocks. Um, so there's quite a bit of content here to cover. I hope we can get through all of it. Um, so this is the rough timetable I have in mind. We'll start with troubleshooting and the hands hands-on exercise there. And this may feel a bit backwards because we're we're going to look at easy config files before we've actually um, covered easy config files in detail. Um, but even if you're writing new easy config files, you'll need to do some troubleshooting. So it, I think it's easier to start with um, looking at troubleshooting and giving you a broken easy config file that you can fix. So gradually looking into errors and log files and figuring things out uh, because those, that um, will come in handy when creating new easy config files as well. So I'll, I'll spend some time here to explain the details about easy config files, um, how you can create them, what should be in there and how. And then we'll have a hands-on example and also an exercise so you can um, create one yourself from scratch. And then hopefully we'll still have time to look at implementing easy blocks as well. And also here, um, I have two exercises, well, one, but in, in two different ways. And hopefully we'll have time to cover some of that as well. Um, so just a bit practical information again, uh, just like last time, the, most of the content will uh, will be through the easy build tutorial website so this one um, there's a last section here which has the overview so the introduction was what we did last time using easy build is what we will do today um, so if you click the overview you will see the four parts if you click using easy build you will see the three parts we'll do today or you will see those same three things here troubleshooting creating easy config files and easy blocks so that's what I'll be focusing on. And usually I'll do a split screen. So half of the screen, the, easy, uh, the tutorial website, half of the screen, a terminal where I will play around. Um, so for the hands-on demos and the exercises, we'll use Putty again at CSE in Finland. So hopefully everybody has an account there. Um, I already saw some questions this morning in the chat. Indeed, the exercises and the demos mentioned slash easy build, um, but you should translate that to this um, on Putty. So the slash easy build is under our project directory for the last preparation. In there, you will also find an easy build module now. So once you've done this module use, you can load easy build as a module. You don't have to install it again or use your own local copy. You can, as long as you have the latest easy build version, it doesn't really matter which one you use, uh, but this is an easy way to uh, use the latest easy build that's installed already. And you should make sure you're, you have properly configured easy build. So tell it to use your home directory or the easy build subdirectory in your home directory, except for the build path, that should be a local directory. Um, this last one is important. I noticed if you do software installations on, um, I think it's a luster file system in your home directory, things go wrong. So uh, the compiler doesn't like um, doing live compilations on the luster file system, it seems. So that's, I don't think that's an easy build problem. It's, a, it's 
the file system or the compiler or the combination of both. But if you use a local directory for the built directories, that should work fine. Um, and I'll, I'll get back to that as well when I do the hands-on uh, demos. So let's start with the troubleshooting part. Um, I'll jump to that here. And I'll walk through it a bit first before I do some hands-on uh, examples. So troubleshooting, um, even when using easy build, things will still go wrong. You'll get compiler um, errors. Um, the installation may fail because of external reasons, being out of disk space or out of memory or God knows what. Um, and there's a couple of things you can do to figure out what went wrong and how to fix it. So when something goes wrong, easy build will throw an error message um, at you for a whole bunch of possible reasons, of course. Um, the error messages are not always very clean, um, I will admit. So this is something we will, we will work on um, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, we have some ideas on how to improve this uh, significantly. Typically, when something goes wrong, you'll get an error message like this. So if something failed, it will tell you, um, at least when it was running a command, it will tell you in which directory uh, that was run. So you can jump in there to see what was wrong. Sometimes if you're lucky, you'll see the actual error in here already, uh, but that depends on how much output was generated by the command that failed, because you only see the first 300 characters of the output message here. So if the error is um, at the start of that output, you will see it straight away. If it's somewhere in the middle, um, you won't see it here and you'll have to jump into the log file. So when EasyBuild does an installation, it keeps track of a temporary log file. And whenever you get an error, it will print the location of that log file and you can grab that, uh, open the log file and check what's wrong. Um, so in this case, uh, it's pretty clear what was wrong. You were using a uh, compiler option that is not supported by G++ or by the particular G++ that was being used. And if you look into it, um, you see here it's using user bin G++, which is probably not what you want to do since this will be using the system compiler and not the one um, in the tool chain that EasyBuild is using. So that's basically the problem here. It should be just G++ to make sure it picks up the first one in, in the path. Then EasyBuild log files, you will often need to dive into those, especially when the error message or yeah, when the actual problem is not mentioned in the error message. Um, so the location of the log file will be printed in the, uh, in the output. Also, when you start an easy build session, and maybe I can already show that. Uh, oh, I'll need to make sure my key is in place. So I'll do the setup, I'll do the module use of the project space. I will load easy build because I don't have it installed and I will do the configuration. So build path in the local directory and prefix basically everything else in my home directory. When I do an installation, of anything, and I will force a rebuild here. Um, you will see that very early on, easy build already prints the location of the log file. So that's one of the first things it does. It will start a temporary log file to track what's going on. Um, if the installation succeeds, it will throw away this log file. So this is really only useful when something goes wrong or if you're quick enough um, to look at it before it disappears. But if the installation completes, it will copy the log file also into the uh, installation directory itself. So afterwards, um, if you notice something wrong in the installation, even though it seems it seemed to have completed successfully, you can still check what EasyBuild was doing, which commands it was running, um, how it set up the environment, what the output was of the commands and so on. So the log file is always there either in temporary location or in the installation directory. And then let's take a look at one of these log files. Um, 
if you use the right path, so the right project 866, then you can copy paste this part and that log file should be there. Yep. So this is a log file for the HDF5 installation. Um, this is pretty verbose. So Easybuild gives you a lot of information just in case you want to get back to it. So it's a bit daunting um, to navigate through it. Um, all the log messages that Easybuild emits will have a format like this, where you have a timestamp, um, the name of the Python module that is part of Easybuild that was printing the log message and also which line number and what type of message it is, whether it's an inform an informative message or a warning or a debug message. I think this one already only has info messages. And then the actual contents of the log message. Um, so there's a couple of tricks. I'll get back to the last log thing in a bit. There's a couple of tricks to navigate um, the log files. So when EasyBuild does an installation, it does it in different steps. There's a configure step, a build step, install step, uh, a module step, all of those. So if you look for build underscore step, for example, you'll jump straight away to the build step and a little bit lower, depending on whether it's a debug, debug log file or not, um, you will see the commands being run um, in the build step and the output that that generated. So the, the steps are definitely a useful way to jump around in the log file to a particular part of the installation. Um, whenever it's running commands, it also always does it in the same way. So you'll have an info message. So if you do info space running command colon, you can jump between the different commands that were being run. Um, and there's a bit of noise here as well because EasyBuild runs some commands just for logging purposes. So figuring out which GCC version or LDD version uh, uses that to pick up some information and also unpacking sources. Um, yeah, so there's a bit of noise here, but most of the commands are the ones that you maybe care about. Uh, is, there, is there any tool that uh, structures the, the, the log file with a markdown or a markup so that it can be further uh, process and to organize you into a page, web page, which you can click through only the uh, command outputs or only the, the commands that were run and stuff like that? Uh, right now, no, we don't have a tool like that, but that's uh, that's an interesting idea. Um, so really most people who are used to using EasyBuild are used to navigating log files and initially it's a bit daunting. Um, but that could be an interesting tool to have indeed to make it a little bit more easier. Um, the, while the installation is running, you actually also get um, partial log files, um, especially if you, have, if you have trace mode enabled. Um, and here I'll have to be quick, but I can cancel the thing halfway. <clears throat> so during the build step here, it was running the make command as a part of the build step. And it was logging the output of the make command to a separate temporary log file only for this make command. So if you have a long running command, you can tail this or you can um, check what's in there while it, it is still running. So there's yeah, there's a bit of log files flying around all over the place. Um, but hopefully that won't be too much of a problem. Uh, when something goes wrong, um, these are a couple of good patterns to look for um, error in various ways. So this is typically what you see when you're running a CMake build, you get error one, which is the first error that occurred. Um, and depending on which build tool is being used, the errors may be reported differently. And of course, sec faults or files not being found um, are common patterns to, to look for. So especially when doing a parallel build like this, make minus J40, the output will, a bit, will be a bit um, yeah, all over the place. So you will get output from different um, processes in the same place. Um, so the errors will typically not be last, but somewhere higher up. So that makes it a bit difficult to, uh, to pinpoint the exact issue. So it can be useful to do an, a rebuild with a parallel one if something goes wrong. So you, you get the 
probably you get the error message last and just by scrolling up you can figure out the, the cause of the error and of course yeah navigating with less or vim or don't have to explain you that uh, that can be useful um yeah looking for steps it's handy to jump to different parts of the installation looking for commands being run um, can be useful and easy build also when it sits environment variables um c flex set to for example it will tell you um, how it's defining environment variables and what the previous value was if it was there so this could be useful as well and then next to the log files you have the build directory um, too so since i cancelled the bzip build i should have a the bzip build directory still there um, so it will be software 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 name software version and then tool chain here it was an, a system tool chain so there's no separate oh, that actually is separate build directory based on the tool chain and then this is the unpacked source in here and in this directory is where easy build will start running the configure the build the install commands and you can check in here uh, what happens for config.log or cmake output files or whatever else and usually you, you get the place where that was happening straight in the error message. Um, and if you, I think if you do a debug log, yeah, if you do a debug log, um, let me show you that. So that can be useful sometimes. Cancel it, so I have, log file here and then running commands um, it also tells you in which directory commands were being run so that that can of course matter sometimes you can you can guess it quite easily but sometimes uh, maybe it's running in the in the wrong directory and then you you want to know so the the debugging makes the the log files quite a bit more verbose so you'll, you'll get a lot of information that you probably don't care about um, but it does happen that information is missing from an info log uh, that you may be looking for. Okay, that was a, a bit quick, I think, but um, the best way of um, getting a feeling of where to look for and how this all works is with an exercise. So the exercise here has um, an existing easy config file that you can copy paste and put in um, a file to use the name of the file doesn't really matter so you can name it example or whatever i'll copy paste this put it in here and then you can give it to easy build try installing it and see what goes wrong so it should go wrong pretty early on and you can try and fix the problems you run into um, so maybe take a couple of minutes to try and fix those this first issue and to make sure we don't wait too long if you've figured out the problem and you know and you have fixed it maybe raise your hand here in zoom so we don't wait too long uh, to continue i won't wait won't wait for everybody to complete it but if let's say half of the people have it then uh, we can show and show it and continue so let's try and finish this in maybe 10 15 minutes before we jump to the next one and of course, meanwhile, uh, feel free to ask questions. To make sure you have your environment properly prepared, it says it again here. Don't forget to add the project directory in front. So the module use you want is this one. Just as a hint, maybe for the exercise, we don't want to um, install a whole bunch of things. So everything we want to use in terms of dependencies is actually already there. So don't try and look for the GCC 8.5. Uh, you won't even find an easy config file for it. It's a version that doesn't exist. So.
So if you raise your hand, I'll assume you've y yes. So finished uh, the exercise, or if you have a question, go ahead. It, it, it's a bit obvious because the the, the path for the uh, for the download is is not there. Uh, so I assume that it is something like. Uh, uh, like in the Docker file, you, you need to get to the file in a local place and point to it or to put the URL, right? Yeah. So, of course, I, I was showing a different error here. So, because of my testing, it's already finding um, the source in my case. Yeah, so I think me... in my case, it was showing a different error message that it. Yeah, let me clean this up indeed. Sorry about that. So what you should be seeing is uh, no, it's still finding it. Let's see. Uh, that's the same error I get. You hit the wrong error. Yeah, the error it, it will tell you is it's not able to find the source file, right? So hmm. why is it able to find it for me? I can just blast this away, actually. I don't really care. Oh yeah, I was removing the wrong the wrong source file, of course. Yeah, so it will try to download it. This may take a while because it, it um, considers a couple of locations and tries a couple of download locations, and that will fail. So this this means EasyBuild doesn't have the source file downloaded yet, um, so it doesn't have it available on the file system in the locations it considers. So that means in this source part, uh, which is in my home directory, there's nothing here. I just removed this directory, so it's not there, and it's also not able to download the sources. And if you check the easy config file, uh, so this is where it specifies the source file. But even though there's a comment here that tells you where to download it, EasyBuild is not able to use this, of course. Uh, so you have two options. I think I have this in the slides as well. Yeah, so the source file is not available yet. There's two ways to fix it. Either um, you download it yourself with curl or wget, and then you put it in the right place, or you somehow convince EasyBuild to download it itself when it can't find it yet. So just a question about the, the, the source code. So, so it seems like there is a defined source code directory for, for EasyBuild. So is that the standard procedure you would use for, let's say, installing a package which has some kind of commercial license so you cannot download the, the source, but you have to get the source to some other place and then you, yep. you put it in this directory? Exactly, yeah. If EasyBuild cannot download the, the installation files itself, you just do it manually and you park it um, either directly in here or symlink it or it doesn't really matter. So if EasyBuild can find it in here, it will not try to download. Hmm. And, and usually we, we have these checksums in place as well to make sure you're actually using the right file. Um, so you don't have a corrupt download or a, a file that's different from what EasyBuild or what this EasyCompre file was tested with. So EasyBuild will check this checksum as well. Um, so to, to show you if I, um, so in here I have sources, Easy build sources, and you'll see it already has created the um, subdirectory here where it will put the file itself. So it will, if Easy build downloads the file, it will put it in the first uh, location in the source path. So you can have multiple locations there, but it will only write, try to write to the first location. The other ones are just read only. So you can actually have sources spread over multiple locations. Um, and then EasyBuild will only use the first one as a, as a right uh, location. What I can do here, I think it's subread tar gz. Is that the one it's looking for? It 
looks like and that's not the one but it has a dash source okay I just create a file for it there. It will find it and then say, okay, I found this file, but the checksum is different. So this doesn't make sense to me. Um, so either this is a corrupt file or you try to trick it into using something it's not happy with. That checksum, of course, if it's not there, it will not, it will not check it. Uh, but usually all the easy config files we have in EasyBuild have these checksums in place. Great, thanks. Okay, to avoid losing too much time, a couple of people have already fixed it. Um, there's two options, let me show you both. Um, so the easy config files actually has a comment that says where to download it. So you can just download this manually. That should work. It's not a small one, but it should be quick enough. And to make sure you have the right file. You can verify the checksum with SHA-256 sum. So this looks exactly what's here. That's good. Um, if you just leave it in place next to the easy config file, easy build will actually also be happy. So the location where the easy config file itself is, is also considered um, when looking for source files. So if you put this in the same directory, it will work. Um, but usually what you want to do indeed, as, as Peter suggested, is you want to move this um, into the source path where EasyBuild will uh, look for files first before considering to download it. So if you now try this, it will be happy. It will find the file. Um, at least it will be happy in the sense that it won't complain anymore about not finding the file. It has also verified the checksum, so that's okay. But that was a manual step. Uh, we can avoid that having to doing the download manually, at least if it's a publicly downloadable file. Um, we can tell EasyBuild where to download it using the source URLs, easy config parameter, and this should not include the name of the file itself. So just the location of the file. And EasyBuild will then, for each of the sources here, it will try to download them at this location and it will add the name of the file automatically here. If we do this now, uh, and this is the wrong one, but I'll remove this one to show you the download happens. I now do the same example again. Easy build is able to do the download. It will verify the checksum and only then will it continue uh, with the rest of the installation. So as long as it's a publicly available download, you might as well let Easy Build do the download um, itself. And either you have a checksum already, maybe you, you get the checksum from the, the website of the software um, and the checksum that's in here this is SHA-256 SHA checksum, but it also supports MD5SUM and EasyBuild will recognize automatically what, what type of checksum it is. Or you can also tell it if it's a particular uh, different type of checksum. Um, it knows about a whole uh, range of different types. So that gives us the, the source files. At least we can try to start the installation now. Now something else goes wrong. So that was the one which I showed originally, uh, which is the tool chain. May I ask uh, about one line sure. in, the, in the EB file? There is the replacement uh, of a version. And uh, past the brackets, there is an S, which would appear, since it is past the brackets, not inside the brackets, the S would appear to yep. be part of the text. However, uh, in the no. actual file name, the S is not present. So is that... Uh, yep. What is, where does where does well, this is go? this is the S is part of the the Python templating mechanism. The S is stands okay. for substitution. So if you do this in in a Python shell, um, let's say source equals this, 
what's actually happening is um, easy build will do this in the background and even though the s is here after the replacement the s is not there so it replaces this part with the version all right thanks yeah this can look a bit confusing if you're not used to this but uh, And there's, there's different ways of, of templating, of course, in, in Python as well, um, depending on which Python version you use. So the, what, what Easybuild does, it, it just, it basically executes this easy config file as Python code. So whatever you can do in Python um, should work here as well. So if, you, if you're a bigger fan of, of different string templating mechanisms, they should work as well. Easybuild just make sure that uh, uh, that's all properly replaced. So the error itself is pretty clear. It's trying to load a, a module for GCC 8.5 since that's the tool chain that's mentioned in the easy config file which is not there, this GCC version doesn't exist. So you, there's no point in trying to install it. And the easiest way forward is just using a different GCC version, which you should be able to find if you did this multiple use. And here, I guess there's actually also two ways to fix it. Um, I'll show you both. And I'll maybe also explain why one is better than the other in this particular case. All right, mm -hmm. I'll continue. Um, so we don't have GCC 8.5. We do have a GCC 10.2 installed in the prepared software stack. So let's try using that. There's two ways that maybe the most obvious way is changing the version here in the easy config file itself. So editing the file and changing the version. Um, before I do that, that's the recommended way I would use here. Before I do that, there's another way, which I briefly want to show you. That is a try tool chain version option in the command line. If you do this, uh, oh, it's actually not happy at all, okay. Um, I was expecting this to work, but it's not because then it really wants to have the GCC toolchain available already. Okay. So say you, you had um, a different version in here that is available, that EasyBuild is aware of. Um, even though you don't have it installed, if you do 8.3, I think this should, oh, this should work. Oh, and already found it, even better. Uh, let me remove that one as well. That's what you get when testing. Um, so now if you try this, if you start from an existing version, meaning a, a GCC version where EasyBuild has an easy config file for, it doesn't have to be installed. Um, and if you use try toolchain version, it will replace the toolchain version automatically and try to continue. So here you see it was indeed using GCC 10.2. Uh, if I do a trace, if I enable trace mode, you will see it even better. When it's preparing the environment, it's loading this as the toolchain module. So this is this is one potential way forward using try toolchain. Um, but what try toolchain does is it takes the easy config file, it creates a temporary copy, it changes the version there, and then tries to continue. Um, if, the, if, it, if the installation fails, um, that's still annoying because your original easy config file hasn't changed and there's probably additional fixes that need to happen here. So for that reason, in this case, it's actually better to change it in here and then try it again. I'll enable trace mode again so we have a better view of what's happening. So now it's happy with the tool chain, it was able to load the module um, as a part of the 
repair step where it sets up the build environment. And then it tried to run the build command. And here it's not very happy. And in this case, the actual error message, uh, I think is not shown here. So you only see the first part of the output and it's cut off here. So there may be stuff after this, um, but you don't see an actual error message here. So now you have to dive into the log file uh, to see the actual error. So may I ask, so let, let's say in the more general scenario where you have an easy build or an easy config and you want to change the, the tool chain or, or actually it doesn't it doesn't support the tool chain you want to use. So, so how would you normally proceed? What would be the recommended way? So it seems from what you are demonstrating now that the way you're supposed to do this is that you copy copy the easy config file into a new one for the correct tool chain and, and change just to change the tool chain rather than using this try tool chain command. It, it depends a bit what, what your goal is. Um... So if you just want to take an existing easy config file that you know should work, so not a broken one like mm -hmm. this, and you want to install it with a newer tool chain, then try tool chain version is okay. Um, because you'll, it will, you will get a temporary copy while doing the installation. But when, once the installation completes, you'll actually get the resulting easy config file in here. So there's this easy config archive where all the and actually, the, the, fi the fixed subread is already in here uh, because I was testing this yesterday. Whenever an installation completes, the easy config file that was used will be, will be copied in here. And not only in here, also in um, the installation directory. So and at that point, you're, you're not really worried. Uh, at that point, you're not, not really worried about the temporary copy. Um, of the easy config file because you know you'll get the the final copy anyway. So for this HDF5, for example, the easy config file that was used is also copied into the sub into a subdirectory. So in, in that sense, it's okay to to use try toolchain version um, because you probably don't want to mess with the temporary easy config file anyway. So it, it's useful in, in that here it's less useful because the installation fails and you probably need more fixes in the easy config mm -hmm. file. So you're you're going to have to fiddle with the uh, the easy config file manually anyway. Okay, so there's, a, there's little there's little use. Um, there's other, other try options as well, which I think we'll be using in the next part. Um, so they, they are useful. The reason they are named try is because you're indeed trying something that maybe people haven't tried before. Um, and actually in this case, we'll, we'll, I had to fix the example when jumping to GCC 10 because it was failing because of the new GCC version. So every now and then you run into surprises, of course. So the, yeah, it depends a bit what, what you're after. Do you, are you trying to fix something that's broken or are you hopeful and you just expect it to work when you jump to a new tool chain? That's okay. And another aspect when jumping to a new tool chain is that you usually also update dependencies as well. So this one doesn't have any, any additional dependencies. Uh, but if it depends on three other software packages, you may have to update, update those versions as well. So it's a bit of a, an iterative thing. We have options for that as well. There's try update depths. And I think uh, somebody was playing with that yesterday. Um, and yeah, also there it's called try because we, we do like a best effort approach, but there's no guarantee that things will actually work. And depending on whether you have easy config files for the dependencies already with that tool chain or not, uh, you may have to do manual job anyway. Okay, let's continue here and see what goes wrong. If we look into the log file, so we get the location of the log file here, so we can open it up. Um, and that's maybe interesting to show the last log thing as well. Easy build has a last log option, uh, which just prints the location of the last log file. That's handy because you can do this and define an alias for it. So if Vim is your favorite editor, you can just run last log and give that to Vim as a location. And then you never have to copy paste the location of the log file. 
since that will be different every time, it will be in a different temporary directory. So last log can be very handy. Typically, when something goes wrong, you start from the end of the log file. So you jump to the end and you start working your way up, maybe looking for patterns like error. Um, easy build also emits log messages with error, but here we see the actual problem where GCC is not happy with the dash fast option and it's giving you a helpful hint to use dash o fast because it knows that exists. So we'll have to fix this. by editing the easy config file. So the fast comes from here. Um, build opts is the uh, additional um, options we give to the build command. So in this case, make, um, and this is where it has the dash fast um, hard coded. The obvious way to fix this is as GCC suggested is to use o fast instead, and that will work. Um, at least that will work in the sense that it will jump to the next problem. But that's actually not the recommended way of fixing this one. Um, because easy build sets up an, a build environment for us and it likes to control. Um, so it, it got past the build step, it got past the install steps, so it's actually continuing. Um, easy build sets up a build environment, uh, which I can show you in the log as well, which I showed before. So C flags, for example. It sets up this environment variable, dollar C flags is set to this, where easy build tells the compiler to generate code for the machine it's been, uh, the compiler is running on, so MRG native, and it will change these compiler options based on which compiler is being used, whether it's Intel or GCC or CLang or something else. It's smart to, to adjust these. So it will be good to use, use this a prepared environment variable then hard coding it to dash o fast. And to do this, you have to be a little bit careful. So we want to use, we don't want to override the large C flags like we're doing here. We want to add to it because this F common thing still has to be there. That's the problem I mentioned with GCC 10. It's a lazy way of fixing the problem with GCC 10, but it's good enough for this exercise. So rather than hard coding the uh, minus O fast, we want to use the existing C flex environment variable like EasyBuild defines it and just add dash F comment to it. And here we have to be a little bit careful because we have to make sure that we use double quotes um, in the command here to make sure that the shell will replace the large C flex with the actual value. Uh, this looks very similar very similar, so inner single quotes and outer double quotes. From a Python point of view, this is pretty much equivalent, but when running the command, it's not. And I'll show you what happens. Um, if you look into the log file, you will see it has a hard-coded polar flags. C flags, but it should have, yeah. So here you get GCC gets very angry at you because you gave it flags. It doesn't know what to do with that. And of course, the dollar C that was in front here was replaced by the shell as an empty variable. And then you get flags there. It gets, first of all, it gets very confusing because you, it's not really clear where the flags come from. Um, but you're not getting the, the behavior you expect. So rather than the shell replacing, the dollar C flex, it replaces the dollar C and you're in trouble. So this is not what you want. If you do the double quotes, it works fine. So with the, with the dollar C flex that we get from the easy build, build environment, um, we will be building with minus O2, minus MRG native and some other um, compiler options that easy build specifies and also those you, you can control um, in in various ways so that's well covered in the easy build documentation so this brings us to the last problem uh, so fixing this two options an easy one and the proper way i would say 
that brings us to the last part, which is the failing sanity check. Um, so whenever EasyBuild does an installation, it runs a quick sanity check at the end where uh, it can do two things. It can check for, and it's better to do this in trace mode again, because you'll get a bit more detail. Um, it will always check for certain files and directories to be there. And depending on what's in the easy config file and what's in the easy block, it will check for different things. So here it knows that for subreads specifically, it's expecting those, these two binary files to be there and this non-empty directory to be there in the installation. It seems it's finding those, so that looks okay. But then it also tries to run a command. So one of these binaries with an option and that one failed. So something is wrong here. And the output already gives a strong hint to what's wrong. And then when checking the easy config file again, you will see this is specified here. If you check the output, you will see the full output of the attempt to run dash dash version. Um, this is actually the partial output. You have to scroll up a bit to see the full output. Here, this is the full output. So this tool also gives you all the supported options and the one you're actually looking for is minus capital V, I think. That's also a useful way to jump around in log files. All these easy build log statements starts with a double equals space and then a date. So if you want to jump to uh, the start of an um, the start of the output of a command, which can also have multiple lines like this, you can uh, search for double equals at the start of a line. Anyway, it's somewhere in here, but uh, the way to fix this is to use the proper argument, which is lowercase v here. I don't think that's 100% correct, but it will at least make the sanity check pass. So what the sanity check command actually does doesn't really matter too much. It has to do something useful in terms of running a command that makes sense, dash dash help, dash dash version, um, so something quick. So here with fixing this, we can redo the installation and that will work. But since it only failed in the sanity check, we don't have to start from scratch. So if this was a build that took half an hour to complete and it only fails in the sanity check because you made a typo in a file or in a command, it's very annoying to have to start from scratch again. Um, in this case, you don't. If it's only a sanity check issue, you can tell EasyBuild to only um, do the module file. So in that case, EasyBuild will skip the configure, build, install steps. It will assume those have already happened and have happened correctly. Um, but it will do the sanity check and it will do the module generation part. And only if the sanity check passes will it actually generate the module file. Oh, let me do this again with trace to see what's happening. So here you see it's skipping a bunch of steps. It's not even unpacking the source files uh, because it assumes that that won't be needed to generate the module file. It's skipping all the actual building and installation steps. And it's only, only proceeding with the sanity check part, checking for files, running the command, checking the exit code. This looks okay now. So it's happy and it generates the module file. And now, as long as we make sure that we pick up the modules that are installed in our home directory, we have subread available. We can load subread and then run the feature counts command ourselves. So that completes that uh, installation. One, one maybe small reminder here, if people are seeing issues with modules not appearing, um, it could be that your LMOD cache is um, outdated. So LMOD generates um, a cache file by itself. So this one was generated just now, I think. Yeah, just now. So if any additional module files appear in my home directory, LMOD may not see them. 
but that's actually a bit of a misconfiguration maybe on, on Putty. Um, the easy way to fix that is just to remove the cache file. Um, so LMOD will be generated. You can, there's an LMOD configuration option that can prevent this from happening. So that's a small detail. If you see modules not appearing in module avail, it's probably the LMOD cache uh, that's uh, getting, getting in the way. Okay, I'll continue with the next part, unless there's any questions. I still see some raised hands, but is that questions or is that finishing exercises? I have one question, Kenneth. Sure. This is Machi speaking. I've managed to broke something because after I changed the minus O fast uh, I'm getting error that I will copy into the chat uh, in one second. Uh, unknown error from the linker. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I saw that when testing as well. Are, are you using the, the temporary directory as a build path? This? Uh, not really. That's yeah, the reason. I, that's, that's, that's important, yes. So apparently the the LD gold linker or the compiler or the combination of both doesn't like it when something is being built on the shared file system on, on Putty. Okay, I, was, I see. I was I was very confused by this as well, but if you use a local directory, you will not see it. Okay, thank you. It's it's a problem that happens more often with parallel file systems. Yeah. It's it's usually not a good idea to do build directories on the on the parallel file system, whether it's lost or oh. GPFS. Uh, is it related? Weird, weird issues. Is it related? And VGFS have similar problems from time to time. Is it related to Python I/O or to Easy Build uh, specifically? It is due to the fact that the last is uh, is doing quite bad with a very big amount of small files. And in fact, for example, at Cifronet we are doing uh, all nearly all com um, compilations on the memfs. So we are doing the RAM, uh, it in the RAM uh, using RAM disk. And it's it, and it, um, by the way, it speeds the, the the thing quite 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 dramatically because you you have usually you have bigger big amount of uh, a huge amount of small files and if you if you put it into the RAM disk, it is very they they could be accessed very fast and uh, and last or G, GPFS or other um, these parallel file system are are very bad with with locking files and creating small files and so on so 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 uh, it is it is very bad idea to to use the these shared systems to to compile anything yes i understand the solution but i i was rather asking about who who really wh whom really hurts uh, this uh, problem with yes, file so, system. Yes, so definitely the the file system, just the file system, yep. and this uh, the, that you these file systems are used to. Uh, they should use the big files, so, and they and for example, uh, creating the file, opening the file, it is quite um, how to say. Um, uh, you, uh, it is. Um, but it's and I think it's an issue of I/O intensive and also timing. So I think the yes. compiler or or the linker thinks it has created a file, and then when it checks again, the file is not there yet because the parallel file system doesn't react quick enough. I think that's yeah, yeah. It, Especially it, that that to create file, you have to you have to go through the all the way down from the from the server and meta server and and up to, down yeah. to the OST. So so it is quite how to say. Uh, it, it, it costs it costs time and it costs resources on the on these uh, shared file systems. Yes, I understand, but I I'm asking because I'm pretty con. Uh, I think if I only run make minus j forty, I will not receive such problems. So I was wondering. Actually, actually you do. I, I was just doing it. I was just doing it manually, and you do. You see the exact yeah. same problem. Ah, okay. Yep. So I I, I ran the make minus j. In, in my home directory. So just by unpacking the source and running this, and you see the exact same problem. If you do it on the local file system, you will not see it. 
No, it's, it's absolutely nothing not visible, visible or really. Python or. Yeah. I get it's such error. Right. I get such error right. messages Thanks. frequently when building on, for instance, BGFS also, and I call them occasionally on GPFS also. Yep. It's just okay. a matter that our five systems are not made for builds, and I think it's actually the timing problem that Kenneth mentioned. Yeah, because in some right. cases I managed to fix it by putting a very, very short and extremely short sleep, a fraction of a second behind the command where it went wrong and before before the command where it went wrong. I see. Thank you. Yeah. But yeah, it's a confusing problem. I, I was scratching my head as well when I was testing and, and not being careful with using a local directory. It looks very confusing. It's, it's very hard to tell it's the power system. Okay, um, let me look at the timetable again. I think we're already a little bit behind. Yeah, that's not a big problem. I will walk you through the easy config files part and then we can take a, a break before we do the hands-on example and maybe some exercises as well. Um, and for this, I'll use the tutorial website here. So I'll jump through this. Um, so creating easy config files, Whenever you do an installation with EasyBuild, there has to be an easy config file for it. So either one you created manually or one that exists in EasyBuild already, or one that is generated automatically, for example, with the try options. Um, and at first, um, one question that pops up often is, do I just need an easy config file or do I also need an easy block? So to remind you about the difference, an easy config file is a .eb file, which is basically a key value definitions, name, version, toolchain, dependencies. So what, what should EasyBuild use? And the easy block is the actual implementation of the installation mechanism. Um, how should that installation be performed? There's two types of, of easy blocks. We'll get back to that in the easy blocks part. Um, and here are some um, rules of thumb to figure out whether you need a software specific easy block or whether you can get away with a generic easy block. So if there's very important values for easy config parameters um, that maybe even depend on the tool chain or depend on which dependencies or which version of dependencies that are being used, you'll have to align multiple things in an easy config file, which can actually be derived automatically. So if that's the case, it's probably better to look into an easy block instead. Um, if you have an interactive command, you can't really handle that from an easy config file. At that point, you're, you probably need an easy block unless there's a, a way to uh, make, the, make the interactive command non-interactive. Um, if there's lots of custom configure options that are specific to dependencies, or if you have to create configuration files that are not easy to, to copy or modify based on files that are there already, or if you feel you're hacking around in the easy config file by um, putting um, hash characters in build ops, for example, to escape part of the uh, build command that EasyBuild would use, then you probably need to look into an, an easy block. Um, things like OpenFoam, TensorFlow, um, all these more complex applications typically have their own easy block because they're just way too complex to handle in an easy config file. Um, and you'll get a better feeling of, of where the line is. It's a pretty thin line and it depends a bit on um, on your personal preference as well. Um, but hopefully by the end of, of this session, you'll have a better feeling once we have written some easy config files and looked at looked closer at easy blocks as well. When writing easy config files, um, usually they're, they have a .eb extension, but that doesn't really matter. EasyBuild doesn't care about the name of the file or the extension as long as you um, specify directly on the eb command line. When EasyBuild goes looking for files, and we discussed this in the in the previous session, um, then the naming does matter. So it expects a name like software name, software version, tool chain, version suffix. Um, so when the robot mechanism tries to find easy config files, it does this only based on the name, not on the contents of files. Easy config files themselves are in Python syntax. So uh, they are basically executed as Python as well, and EasyBuild just takes the new variables that are defined as a result of that um, to figure out uh, how to do the installation. Uh, the order of easy config parameters mostly doesn't matter. 
Um, so you can put name at the bottom and toolchain at the top. Um, that works fine. So it, it basically just key value. So order doesn't matter. With the exception that if some things are defined um, using the values of other easy config, if you config parameters, then order does matter, of course. Something has to be defined first before it can be used to define something else. But that's expected. Um, and usually we, we try to keep the same order of parameters in easy config files just to make it easier for humans. Um, and they're more or less in the order that the installation goes. Um, so configure options go before build options, sanity check goes last, things like that. There's um, five easy config parameters that have to be defined by every easy config file. Software name, software version are not a surprise. Uh, we always require the uh, home page and description for the software. This is used uh, to generate the module file. Um, and these are in the easy config file because they could differ between version um, of software. So that's they're typically not handled in an easy block. And the tool chain always has to be uh, specified as well. So what compiler tool chain should easy build use to do the installation? These five are hard required. Name and version are pretty obvious. These are just string values specifying the name and the version. Home page and description are also just string values. And the description is often a multi-line string. So you have these triple quotes that are the way in Python to specify multi-line strings. The tool chain uh, is very often a proper tool chain like this, like we saw in the example in the troubleshooting part. Uh, and there are exceptions where we use this special system tool chain, which means um, I'm just going to use whatever is available on the system in terms of compiler. Um, there's two um, use cases where this makes sense. Um, that's when doing binary installation. So when there's no compilation being done at all. So the, the system, the compiler you use doesn't matter. Or when we're inst installing our own compiler, we need the compiler to build uh, that compiler, of course. So then, for example, when installing GCC, we also use the system tool chain as a way of bootstrapping the GCC installation. We try to limit the use of the tool chain of the system tool chain um, to make sure we're in control over which compiler and which version is being used um, to do installations. Um, so those five are the only ones that are actually hard required. That may seem a bit weird because there's no sources here, there's no dependencies here. Why are those not required? That's because there are cases where you can actually do installations without having sources. For example, when just bundling things together um when you want five different modules that are loaded by another module um, you don't actually need any sources to build that bundle module um, so that's why sources are optional um, that's also explained here so usually you do have sources and maybe patch files um, available for most installations but they're not a hard requirement when you do have sources you hopefully have source urls as well where you can um, download um, the necessary files. So EasyBuild can download them automatically when they're not available yet. And usually you have checksums as well. In this case, we have two checksums, one for the source file, one for the patch file. And whenever checksums are in place, EasyBuild validates them before continuing with the installation. Um, these are list values. So um, also sources, even though there's only a single source here, um, it's always a list, same for patch files, it's always a list. So that's what the square brackets mean. It's Python syntax for lists of strings or lists of anything. Are checksums required or just optional? That's a good question. Um, by default, they are not hard required. You can configure EasyBuild to require checksums if, if you want to enforce that in your own um, EasyBuild installation. Um, but upstream, so for all easy config files we have in the central easy build repository, since a couple of years, we now hard require checksums for everything. So they're required when contributing something back. They're not hard required in easy build itself, but you can configure easy build to ensure there are checksums for everything before it installs something. Thanks.
And I suppose uh, the the order of the checksums does not have to match in any particular order the order of sources or patches. Uh, they are just it's a it's a set operation, not a list operation to match them. No, right? it's not. It's it's a list, so it has to match. So this checksum is for the source. This checksum is for the patch. Um, we do have support for sets of checksums, so you can actually give. That sounds a bit weird, but you can you can give multiple valid checksums for a, for a single source file. So if you make this um, a tuple, so with round brackets, and you give it two checksums, that's two alternative checksums for the first source file. All right. But in this case, this is a checksum for the source. This is a checksum for the patch. So EasyBuild will not say, OK, if the patch file matches this, I'm happy. No, it, it's going to complain that the patch file doesn't match this check, checksum. So it does a one to one. Uh, verification. All That's right, also you. why we why we use a list here, and in Python, lists have order. So, um, another common um, parameter to define is the easy block. Um, so, which easy block should easy build use to do the installation? This is optional because by default, easy build will go looking for an easy block that matches the software name. So if you do name equals TensorFlow, EasyBuild will look for an easy block specifically for TensorFlow. Um, and if that's not there, it will complain unless you specify with the easy block parameter that it should use configure make or Python package as an easy block. And we'll see that in the example as well. So uh, this is optional because EasyBuild has an automatic way uh, of looking for an easy block based on the software name. There's a distinction between generic easy blocks and, and software specific easy blocks, which I already mentioned. So examples of generic easy blocks are these, C make make, Python package, you will use some of them in, in the examples. Um, a software specific easy block always starts, the name of a software specific easy block always starts with EB underscore. So that's how you can easily tell whether it's a software specific one or a generic one. The generic ones we can we can freely pick those names so th these have not these don't have the eb underscore prefix uh, i will get back to that as well when uh, looking at, at implementing easy blocks uh, in the example we are using make cp easy block which is not in the list of the common ones uh is it related to any specific or is it derived from some um, it's it's not listed here. It, well, I would say it's actually pretty common. It's derived from configure make, where the configure step is just skipped, and the install step is not make install, but is is copying files. So it's basically for software that only has a make file without a proper make install target. All right. Thank you. Um, I I didn't list it here, but it is listed if you look into the documentation, which is linked. You'll see make CP here. Um, it gives you an idea of what's uh, what's going on. So no configure step, no make step, and it will make CP will require that you specify the files to copy list. So which file should be copied into the installation directory? Um, there's a set of Easy config parameters which you can always define. So name, toolchain, uh, dependencies, these are all supported for everything. And you can check which ones are supported using eb-a, which is short for uh, avail easy config parameters. So this has a long list um, of mandatory ones. It actually lists these two as mandatory, but they're not in practice. Um, and this, yeah, this gets very long, of course, but you'll see things here like uh, config opts and pre-built opts, so the ones that we briefly mentioned, and a whole bunch of other ones as well. This gets quite extensive, um, but all the ones listed in the output of EB-A are supported for every easy block. Um, some easy blocks have additional um, easy config parameters, which are only supported for this particular easy block. And you can figure out which ones by using the dash E option or short for dash dash easy block and give it the, the name of the easy block. So if you look at the output of this, you'll see below the mandatory section, you'll see an easy block specific section. So these only make sense 
um, when using the configure make easy block or the easy block that is derived from configure make. Uh, so they, these don't make sense, for example, when using the Python package easy block. And easy build will tell you as well if you try to define build command and you're using an easy block that doesn't support this, you will get an error um, and it will tell you that doesn't make sense. Dependencies is very common as well. Um, easy build discriminates between two types of dependencies, runtime dependencies and build dependencies. So runtime dependencies are needed for actually using the software. Um, they are also the modules for these dependencies are loaded in the build environment, also when doing the installation. And the, the module file that is generated will include load statements for these runtime dependencies. So whenever you load the software, the dependencies are loaded automatically as well. Um, for build dependencies, these are only loaded in the build environment and the module file will not load CMake because that doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, you don't need CMake to run software usually. Um, these are, uh, this is a list of dependencies. Each dependency is a tuple, so name, version. Um, sometimes um, dependencies have an additional um, element in the tuple, which is the version suffix. So if you have a non-empty version suffix for the dependency, um, you may have to specify it as well to make sure that easy build finds the module or finds the easy config file if it's not installed yet. And here you see also again these template values. Um, so we saw version before. In this case, it's uh, pi ver. So this is a, a template that's automatically defined based on the Python version if Python is included as a dependency. So pi ver will be um, 3.8.2. There's also a pi short ver, which is only 3.8, um, which you need in, in, when, in the sanity check, for example, you often need only the short Python version. Uh, and there's a, a list of, um, yeah, it's not linked here, but there's a list of defined templates in the documentation and also on the command line, avail easy config templates. You can ask easy build which templates it, it knows about, like for example, version or version minor, um, or for dependencies, uh, there's, by short fur, which is the ma major minor version of the Python or the full Python version and so on. So all of these are templates you can use in easy config files. That's dependencies. The, the version suffix um, is basically a label that you can add um, to the module name to discriminate between different configurations uh, of the software or um, for example, a version that depends on Python 2 and a version that depends on Python 3. Um, so you can, you can discriminate between different configurations of software through a version suffix. So this is a mechanism we use very often. And that's also why here you have an, an additional element for SciPy bundle, which specifies in this case, we're looking for a SciPy bundle that matches this Python version. A common uh, way of doing that is, for example, for stuff that still requires Python 2, which does exist, unfortunately, um, or when uh, you have a CP2K installation for uh, MPI only, so popt or the hybrid version, the PSMP, that's how you can easily discriminate between these different configurations. Then uh, option or parameters to customize the installation procedure, which we briefly saw as well in the subread example. Um, so the, the configure, build, test, and install steps um, have two parameters available, a pre, in this case, config opts. So this is just a string value that is glued before the configure command, and a config opts, um, which is glued after the configure command that EasyBuild will run as usual. Same for build, test, and install. So a concrete example here, if you use config opts equals dash dash enable HDF5 support, 
that will make easy build add this part after the configure command it will run by default which is typically in case of configure make dot, dot slash configure dash dash prefix the location of the installation directory and then it usually stops unless you give it config opt then it adds those as well into the command um, the pre uh, options are useful if you have to run stuff before the command actually gets run and here you have to be a little bit careful typically you use the double ampersand to um, concat multiple commands after each other and make sure that this command runs successfully before you continue with the other command so with pre-built up in this case we're making sure that this part gets glued before the make command um, which will be run by configure make by default the, the configure make easy block is smart or actually easy build is smart enough to determine how many cores are available so it will it will always do a make minus j number of available cores uh, so that's dynamic um, unless you tell it not to so you can restrict it to just one core or two cores if there's a good way to do that or a good reason to do that um, and same here install opts prefix equals install there so this is another template which will be replaced by the actual location of the install directory. And this makes sure we run make install like this, where the dots are replaced by the path to the install directory. So you can see through these options, we get a lot of flexibility to, to steer uh, the installation done by a generic easy block like configure make without having to implement an easy block ourselves. And then the sanity check, we've seen this. So the sanity check, it, I think is a very important part of easy build where it tries to make sure that the installation worked, that the stuff that should appear is actually there, that simple commands like dash dash help or dash dash version um, can run. And it's a very good way of, of uh, at least recognizing a totally broken installation. So even though make exits with code zero it doesn't mean the installation actually fully worked um, the way you want it to so we're we're strict is maybe the the, the, the wrong word but we're um, making sure that we have sanity checks in place for all the easy comfy files we have in the central repositories we feel this is a very important part um, easy build will do a sanity check by default by checking for a non-empty bin directory and a non-empty lib or lib64 directory so if you don't tell it to check for something specific, as long as a bin and a lib directory are there, it will be happy, but it's probably not a good idea to rely on that. And then the module class is usually there. We have these categories of software. Um, and at least for the central easy config files, we have these module classes defined as well. So that's the most important parts of an easy config file of course depending on the software you're installing um, you'll get additional parameters that may be mandatory or maybe very very much required to get a proper installation but that, that depends a lot on which software you're installing and then in terms of generating easy config files from existing ones so the try software version i already mentioned that can be very useful Try toolchain can be very useful as well. If you have an existing easy config file and you only want to change the toolchain, you can avoid doing it manually using try toolchain. Um, again, the try aspect here is important. Uh, this may um, fail if you're, certainly when you're switching compilers, you often run into surprises. Even when doing trivial version bumps, maybe they changed from configure make to CMake in the new version and then of course you have to change the easy block and change the configure options and things like this so it's it's a good idea to try this but the chances of success are not always that big and there's additional try options as well um, th this try toolchain also collaborates with the dash dash robot for example so if you do try toolchain and dash dash robot it will try and generate easy config files also for the dependencies that are still missing um, there's a lot of things you can you can do here or at least try here to help you and avoid that you have to uh, copy and edit easy config files manually 
for copying easy config files, there's a small option as well that can be useful. Um, if you want to take an existing easy config file and you don't really know where it is, you could use eb search first and then get the full location, copy paste that location and just give it to the CP command. Or you can do eb uh, copy ec, so to let easy build copy an existing easy config file from no matter where to a specific file or a specific directory um, quite easily. So that, that can be handy as well. And here I have an example prepared, um, which I can build up gradually, but maybe we should take a short break first before we go into that. Does that make sense? Yes, break sounds very good. <laughs> okay. let's, let's take a 15 minute break. So we'll start again, 10 to 11. Thank you. Thank you. continue. Um, so what I want to do here is a hands-on example of creating an easy config file from scratch for um, a toy software package, which I came up myself with some help from others. It uses CMake and I absolutely despise CMake. So I got somebody else to write the CMake lists for me. Um, it's a pretty basic thing. It's a single source file with a header file it has a CMake list. So we're probably gonna use CMake. Um, to get this installed. And it has a friendly readme file that gives us basic installation instructions. So that looks pretty good. Um, so I'll get started with this. First of all, make sure our environment is set up properly, which I did here. Use the central software stack, load easy build, configure easy build, make sure we use the temporary directory. In this case, it probably doesn't matter too much, uh, but that's a good practice to have things properly set up. Um, okay, so to start with, we'll need to make sure the mandatory easy config parameters are in place, name, version, home, home page description, and tool chain. In here, I have the tool chain missing deliberately just to show you what happens when you do that. So this is a decent starting point for an easy config file. We try to install this. EasyBuild will yell at us. Oh, even he first yells about the easy block. Okay, that's a bit surprising. Um, I was expecting it to yell first about the tool chain, but it will yell that yell about that next, I guess. Um, so here it says there's no software specific easy block for EB minus EB EB minus tutorial. So it's it's looking for an easy block that's specific to the EB tutorial software package. That's what it does by default. If you don't tell it to use a particular easy block, it will assume there's a software specific easy block. If it can't find that, it will just give up. So in this case, um, jumping ahead a little bit here, I'll get back to the toolchain part. Uh, we're hitting this issue. Uh, we see a CMake lists in the sources and the unpacked sources and the installation. Procedure tells us we'll have to run CMake. So this is probably going to be a job for the CMake make easy block, which we briefly mentioned before. So I'll include that here. Usually the easy block goes on top. It doesn't really matter too much in terms of order. And this is case sensitive. So we have to make sure we get this right. Or easy build will again yell at us. This is a generic easy block because it doesn't start with EB underscore. Um, so you can find this in the list of generic um, easy blocks in the documentation, or certainly in lots of example or other easy config files, you will find that this is used quite often. Uh, so after it's happy with the easy block, now it knows it will use CMake make. The next thing it yells about is the tool chain. So we're, we didn't specify the tool chain. This is a mandatory um, easy config parameter. So We'll include that as well. We'll again use the same PCC version for this example as well. So now it will be happy in terms of mandatory easy config parameters. And it will actually try to do the installation. Um, it looks like it uh, managed to start the configure step, but then that went horribly wrong. And from this, we can't even tell what went wrong. 
So we can check the log file. Jump to the end. Uh, and here we say CMake command not found. So because we're using the CMake make, easy block, easy build knows it should run CMake in the configure step. And it tried doing that. It even nicely um, generated the full CMake command line, which is quite long. Um, so it specified the installation directory it should be the uh, release uh, build. It specified the names of the compilers, the compiler flag. So all of that was automatically done by the CMake make easy block. And it tried running that command and it failed horribly because CMake is not available. Indeed, if we check on the system, there is no CMake. So that makes sense. Um, that's this part here. CMake not found. We do have CMake available though as a module. So if you set up the central software stack, you should see this one used, uh, this one available rather. So this particular version of CMake we can use as a build dependency in our easy copy file here. So we can add build dependent dependencies, which is a list. And each, let me do it like this, it's a little bit clearer. Each, each entry in the list is one uh, build dependency and just giving the name and the version in this case is fine because there's no version suffix for CMake. So what will happen now and to return back to the previous session last week, we can always check what EasyBuild would do without it actually doing it using the extended dry run option or dash X. So if you use dash X here, we'll get a lot of output. So we better pipe this to less. Um, EasyBuild will tell us what it will do after a couple of seconds. So we can make sure we got this right. Uh, it's using the CMake easy block. We already knew that. If we go to the configure step, we can check, to, we can check what it will do. So, this is a bit more, it's actually setting up environment variables as well. It wasn't showing that in the trace output. It will try running the CMake command. And to check that it's actually picking up on the build dependency, we can scroll back to the repair step. And here it says, I will load CMake as um, a module in the build environment. So it basically did this module load CMake. And because the module already exists, it knows what kind of modules will be loaded at the time of the installation. And it also tells us the full built environment in terms of environment variables. So if we drop the dash X, it will actually go ahead and do that. It should be able to find the CMake command now and do the configuration. It's still failing in the configure step, but probably with a different error. jump back into the log files, go to the end. So now this is the error we get. This looks like an actual proper CMake error. Uh, so it found CMake, it tried to run it, and now it's CMake itself that's complaining. And it's saying the source directory here does not appear to have a CMake list.txt. Okay. So we can, this is the location where CMake is being run, or actually it's the source directory that's passed to CMake as an argument. If we check in here, we see this directory. So whenever EasyBuild uses the CMake make easy block, it will set up a separate build directory because you're not supposed to um, build CMake software straight in the source directory. It has to be in a clean empty directory on the side. So EasyBuild does that for us automatically, but there's nothing here. This is empty, even the, the top um, directory is empty. So there's no files here at all, why not? Well, we didn't specify any sources. So sources is not a required um, easy config parameters. It's, it's optional. But of course, if you have software that actually, uh, if you have a proper software package you want to install, not just a bundle of things that are existing modules, you need to specify source files. So we'll go ahead and do that. You have to fix this error, you need to, of course, give it source files like this or at least we could use this. Um, this would work, but this hard codes the version number in the name of the source file. 
uh, which we is a bit silly since we already know the version here and we want to reuse that. We can do that with this template. So again, the same version template here we saw before. That's a little bit nicer because if we then want to bump the version, um, we just have to change this version number either directly in the easy config file or with try software version. So what try software version will only do is change this line. It will not touch lines like this, which have the version hard coded, which is why we like to use this templating mechanism. And in this case, because this is a pretty standard name for a source file, we actually have a constant that's exactly this. So name dash version dot tar dot gz. So we could use this as well. So let me use that one. And this is a constant template value. So we saw the value, the templates before. Source star gz. Yeah. So you'll see it mentioned here. Source star gz is exactly equivalent with name dash version tar dot gz. So this should work. Um, of course, here the same issue. We need sources. Um, they will not be available yet. And we would like EasyBuild to download them. So we'll give EasyBuild the location where to download this file. So the full URL was mentioned on top uh, here. This is the full location. So we just need this part without the file name. We put this in source URLs, and this is a string value. So we give it quotes. We try this again. Now, EasyBuild will actually download the source files, do the unpacking, and then when we run CMake, it will now be able to actually do the configuration rather than complain that it, it can't find stuff. It fails again in the configuration step. Uh, I want to blame CMake here, but it's not really CMake's fault. But it's uh, failing in a different way. Now it was actually able to do the configuration, but there was something it didn't like. It says here, EB tutorial message is not set. So this is a required um, configure option for this software package. So this is a very handy readme file that doesn't tell you everything. Yeah. That should be no surprise. So there's a required configure option here. Um, so we need to give it an extra um, option to the CMake command. And for this, we can use the config opts. Uh, is a config parameter. Um, so we can tweak the CMake command as we need to. So we're giving minus D this configure option and we give it this value hello from the easy build tutorial. So that should make the configuration step happy. We do this again. Now it should at least pass the configure step. There it goes. It does the actual build. It's a single source file, so that's quick. It does the actual installation, which is make install in this case. And then it proceeds and it fails in the sanity check. And here it says sanity check failed. No non empty directory found at lib or lib64. So the standard sanity check is expecting to find both a bin directory and a lib lib64 directory. If we check in our um, target directory, so easy build software, name of software version dash toolchain, if we check what's in there, there's only a bin directory with a command no lib directory. It's no surprise for a small software package like this. So we'll have to tweak the sanity check. So let's do that. Um, there's two parts to a sanity check. So the part that's failing is the uh, files and directories it's looking for. So that's done through sanity check paths, which is a Python dictionary. So that's the curly braces, which um, expect a dictionary with two entries, files and directories, so files and dirs. And in this case, we'll only have a binary file, bin eb tutorial. We expect that to be there. And there's no point in also checking for a non empty bin directory because that's already implied here since we're looking for a specific file. There's no other directory, so we can't really list anything useful in here. That should make it happy. 
Um, and again, since it was failing in the sanity check, we can use module only. We don't actually have to redo the configuration and the installation. We just want to redo the sanity check and the module generation. So that worked fine. It was happy with the file it found. Um, now we could actually do a little bit better in the sanity check. We know the file is there, but does it actually work? This is a binary, so we can try running this. Sanity check commands is another part of the sanity check where we can just run EB tutorial. We, we don't have to give it the location where the command is because the module file that EasyBuild generates will update the whole part. So the command will automatically uh, be added in our path variable. Visible does this automatically. If it sees a bin subdirectory, it says, okay, this probably needs to go in part. So we'll go ahead and add that uh, by default. If you're not happy with that, you can change it, but usually you, you want this. I can redo the installation and enable trace mode to show you that it's running the EB tutorial command in the sanity check. Yeah, so it's finding the file. It says, okay, and then it's actually running the binary and it also says, OK, so this looks all good. And let's take a quick look at the module file it generated as well. Uh, so there's a bunch of things here. We always set prefix path for all installations we do. So CMake is aware of them. And we update the dollar path variable to add the bin subdirectory. So the commands that are provided by this um, installation are found as well. And then some other things specific to each built eb root eb version are always defined ignore the eb devil thing we'll, we'll get rid of that soon the module file will also generate the tool chain because that's assumed to be a runtime dependency um, and it includes some description of the software based on the home page and the description that's available in the easy config file so that gives us a full working easy config file for this example uh, software package, which is also shown here. It's basically exactly what I came up with. The small difference, the checksum is not there. Um, I can add it manually, or there's a command line option that does that adds the checksum for me. You can do inject. I have to be a little bit careful. Well, I can actually show you what goes wrong. If you do this, EasyBuild will yell at you and say example.eb. I don't know what type of checksum that is. So the inject checksum takes an optional argument. If I do it the other way around, there's no optional argument to inject checksums. And then it will assume we want a SHA-256 uh, checksum, which is the default one, the, the default type we use in EasyBuild. If I do inject checksums, it will first check if there's any checksums already. If there are, it will refuse to replace them unless you force it to. If there's no checksums yet, it will determine the checksum of the file it found and go ahead and add that into the easy country file in here. So you can also do this manually, of course, especially if the software mentions checksums on their website, you want to use that one and make sure that the downloaded one matches that. Um, but the inject checksums is quite useful as well. So that more or less concludes this, this part. I do have a couple of exercises, but I don't know if we should spend time on them um, right now, or if we continue with the easy blocks part and try to stick to the time. Uh, I don't know, Nicola, what makes most sense? I, know, I, I guess probably if you are short in time, probably it's better to go with the easy blocks. I mean, the exercise is something we can do anyway. Yeah. Because they're uh, very well done in the tutorial, so it's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's, I mean, there's I don't know four if small if exercises. Other people agree, like, let's hear what the other people say. Does anyone object to moving on to easy blocks? Let me ask it like that. No. So, so the exercises, what, what do they do actually? Yeah, so they do. Ah, so the, the exercises, um, there's four different ones, four small ones. So the first one is taking the example, which I just created here. And um, so if you run it manually, let me show you that maybe as well. So what we compiled 
is a small binary that just spits out the message you give it. And the first exercise is to change this message. So redo the installation and change the message and make sure it mentions your, your username. So you can use the dollar user environment variable to make it produce the username, but you have to be careful with quoting to make sure you don't get the dollar user here, but your actual username. So that's the first exercise to change the existing easy copy file to make it do that. The second one is to uh, install a newer version of the software. So there's in here, we installed 101. There's also a 110. Um, so you can try doing that. Um, so that should be very easy as well. Um, yeah, and also it tells you here not to make any manual changes. So that's a, that's a tip. Um, so don't edit the easy config file, but do it in a different way to install a new version. Uh, we mentioned that a couple of times. And then the third one is a, is a bigger one. Um, so this is for another software package, which is actually Python bindings to this EB tutorial. Um, so that's another easy config file you have to create from scratch. And it gives you some tips on how to do that. So I think this, this is a, a good exercise to try yourself and basically follow the steps I did start with mandatory easy config files and gradually work your way towards a working easy config file and try to fix the problems you, you hit along the way. And the full solution is here at the bottom. If you click this, you will get the full solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just wondering in, in general how, let's say how complicated they were, if, because sometimes it's nice to be able to ask questions, but I mean, we can do that later, so it's okay. You can, you can ask questions in the rocket chat and uh, I'll, yeah, I'll hang exactly. out there and um, if there's any anything that doesn't work or any questions you have, feel free to ask them there. And I'll, certainly the rest of the day today and even rest of the week, I'll, I'll hang out there. So feel free to ping me. I'm happy to answer them. So they are introductory level. They should be relatively easy and give you lots of hints. And if you really want to, you can peek at the solution. Um, so it should certainly be doable to, to do this yourself. Okay, then the easy blocks part. This is another um, big section. Um, I will only cover the basics here because you can take this very, very far. Um, but I also have two exercises here at the end, which again include the solutions. Um, and maybe if I have enough time, I will actually do one of them um, as a demo and then you can do the other one yourself. So easy blocks are Python modules, Python scripts in some sense um, that talk to the easy build framework to get an installation done. And they use the information from an easy config file to figure out what exactly needs to happen. So which versions, which tool, which versions of dependencies, which tool chain to use, um, where to download sources. So that kind of information is taken from an easy config file. Again, there's a difference between generic and software specific. Easy blocks, I already explained that. That's also important in terms of how things should be named. So there's two naming aspects to easy blocks. There's the name of the Python class and the name and the location of the Python module file itself. So you have to get both of these right in order to let easy build uh, pick up on them. Um, at least for software specific easy blocks, that's very important to get the naming right. So the first aspect here is a Python class name. Um, for software specific easy blocks, this always starts with EB underscore. Um, that's mainly done to discriminate between generic and software specific easy blocks. And also because we want to be able to support any uh, software name out there. So we have this escape mechanism or this encoding mechanism uh, because very early on we, we saw software names that have like open byte character speed shop or whatever funky things people come up with hash hash characters or yeah they seem to make a sport out of it to come up with something funny or cool looking and then you need a good way to handle that in, in a tool like easy build so we came up with this encoding mechanism you take the name of the software and you uh, mangle it a bit so you can use it as a class name in python and what you do is you replace spaces by underscore you replace dashes and other characters by um, a translation of the symbol into something that starts and ends with an underscore. So dash becomes underscore minus underscore. 
and underscore becomes underscore 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 if you want to say it like this um so there's a couple of rules to follow here but you can basically ask easy build what the class name should be um so with the simple python um script basically you can import the function that does the encoding and you can just give it the name of the software and you'll get back the answer what the name of the python class should be so in this case netcdf dash fortran becomes netcdf underscore minus underscore fortran that's the class name um the class name for generic easy blocks don't, you don't need to do the encoding thing here because there's no direct relation to a software name you can pick anything um, so configure make bundle see see make python package it doesn't really matter um, you're in full control here so if you do implement your own generic easy block um, you you're fully free to pick the name and it doesn't start with an eb underscore either uh, the name of the module file so the python file itself also has to be what easy build expects it to be um, and here you basically take again the software name you do lowercase and you replace a dash with an underscore and any other special characters you just drop so gcc becomes gcc.py netcdf dash fortran becomes netcdf underscore fortran and anything else like braces or spaces you just kick them out um, like this well i guess the space also becomes an underscore but you get the idea same thing here you can ask easy build based on the software name what should the name of the module file the python module file be or based on the class name of the easy block what should the module file be so for both of them you can use the same uh, function and knows how to tell these apart if you look into the central easy blocks repository uh, you see that we organize things a bit uh, based on the first letter of the software and we have a separate directory for generic easy blocks so cmake make configure make python package all of these live in here and then in, the, in these letter directories you have things like the software specific easy block for tensorflow and if you look into that one so that's called tensorflow.py everything lower score and the class name which is a bit lower this is a quite complex easy block the python class name is eb underscore tensorflow with the right capitalization um, if you're coming up with your own easy blocks um, they don't have to be a part of the easy build installation itself so you don't actually have to put them in this um, organized directory here they can live anywhere um, and you can use the include easy blocks configure option to add one or more easy blocks into your python installation this is both for new easy blocks and also easy blocks which you have changed and you would like to overrule what's in um, easy build itself so if you're if you made a copy of the cmake make easy block you made some changes to it and i want to use that one um, as long as you give the path to include easy blocks that one will be used and not the one that's included with easy build itself so you get full control over what easy blocks are used and i will show that in the um, in the exercise as well then looking into the easy block itself the overall structure is a bunch of import statements and then a class definition um, of the easy block and in the class definition you have multiple methods that are implemented for the different steps that you want to customize um, in this particular easy block um, in this case it only shows configure step but if you're deriving from the, the base easy block class then you always need to define configure build and install because those are not defined in framework at all uh, you will get an, a not implemented error if you uh, try omitting uh, one of these so the very minimal um, easy block when starting from scratch is uh, configure build and install you have to implement those methods um, the different steps that easy build do all have a corresponding underscore step um, method and all of the methods that you can customize in an easy block you can check in the api documentation so if you look here 
this is the definition of the base um, easy block class. And you'll see methods here like build step. It says here abstract method. So that means um, the easy block class doesn't implement this. It just gives it as a handle. And if you actually want something to happen, you'll need to implement the build step method yourself. Um, there's a whole bunch of other ones as well. That you, you can redefine or enhance if you want to, um, depending on the, your use case, of course. Most of these, you probably don't want to change. Uh, some of these you have to, like configure step. Um, and there are cases like prepare step, for example, where it sets up the build environment. This one could be interesting if you want to get additional environment variables defined or you want to change something what EasyBuild does by default. Um, you can override this method as well and make some changes. Um, okay, that's the most important part of that. Then you can also derive from existing easy blocks, typically from a generic easy block. So if you have a software package that uses configure make, but has some specific stuff that needs to happen for this particular easy block, you can start from configure make and just uh, customize the things you want to customize. Uh, in this case here, we're extending the configure step and we're first copying a file from an example file, I guess, to a file that's actually going to be used for the configuration. And then we move on to the actual running of the configure command. So we just call back um, to the parent module. Uh, okay. Yeah, so deriving from an existing easy block, you start from configure make, for example, and you derive the class um, from this rather than directly from the, the base easy block class. Then the easy config parameters, which are defined in an easy config file like this, you can access them in the easy block through self.cfg. So CFG is short for easy config in this case. Um, and all, of, all the easy config parameters that are supported, also the ones that are not defined in the easy config file, you can access this way. For some of them, we have a, a more direct way, like you do, if you do self.name, that's equivalent to self.config. That will become more clear in the example as well. So also things like config opts, pre-built opts, all of those are accessible through this self config uh, class variable. Um, you can just check the values of these. You can also update them. Um, so if you want to add additional configure options before you actually do the configuration, uh, you can change values like config opt, but you have to be a little bit careful. Um, if you want to just replace the value um, of an easy config parameter in the easy block, you can. I just reassign a value, a different value. That's not always smart because then you're totally ignoring what's in the easy config file. Um, so usually you either want to, you want to honor what's in the easy config file since that's where the installation is being controlled. But there could be cases where uh, you know it is safe to just ignore what's there, um, that's possible. Usually you want to update an existing value. And for this, you actually have to use the dot update method. Otherwise you will run into surprises. So in this case, we're, um, we want to update a, a list value. So an easy config parameter, that's a list. We want to add the example string as an extra element to that list. If we do it like this with self config update, it'll work. If you try this, so grabbing the value, the existing value, and use the dot append method, which is a, a standard Python function or method, I guess, for adding stuff to an existing list, this will not work. Um, this the existing some list value will not be updated because of some some implementation details. The the value you get here is not the reference to the actual value that's being kept, but it's a copy and you will run into surprises. So whenever you want to update an easy config parameter, use the self config update mechanism instead, and then it will work nicely. Next to standard easy config parameters, you can define custom ones as well that only, uh, which are only relevant for this particular easy block. 
Um, and this is done through this static method named extra options. So here we're defining two additional easy config parameters, one that's required, one that's optional. Um, and you tell easy build that this is a mandatory one and this is a custom or option optional one. So that means this one has to be defined by the easy config file. And if not, easy build will complain. And this one you can define, but it's not strictly required. So, and that's done yeah, through this static method, which is a little bit different. is the standard Python constructor. Um, this is useful to use if you want to initialize some um, class variables, so things that you know that you will define later on um, in the configure step, for example, or in the build step, and then also reused in other steps. Um, so that's useful to do that in the, in the constructor. There's an important side note here, which I'll get back to a little bit later. Um, you have to be a little bit careful when you do things like this, when you're sharing variables between different steps. Um, there's some things you need to take into account there. So I'll get back to that. And then common file operations, reading files, writing files, copying files, creating directories, um, changing files by applying regular expression, substitutions, um, removing files, all of that is functionality provided by the EasyBuild framework. So you can use the existing functions rather than um, figuring out how to do this in Python. All of these functions are available in the file tools um, package that's part of the EasyBuild framework. And they're all listed here with some hopefully informative um, help and documentation for each of the options uh, these functions provide. And similarly for running shell commands like make or cmake, um, there's functions for this available as, as well. There's a run command function to run shell commands, which are non-interactive. And there's a separate function to run interactive commands. Like sometimes you have installation scripts, which ask you a question and then you have to give an answer um, interactively. So we have a way of automating that and you can give it a Python dictionary with patterns of questions to look for and then the matching answer that should be given uh, if or when that question is being asked. So hopefully you don't need this because getting this right is a, is a bit of a hassle, uh, but once it's there, it works really nicely. And there's some options then for running shell commands. Um, what EasyBuild will do by default is it will run the shell command and check the exit code. If it's zero, it's happy and it will continue. It will lock the output in the log file and then continue with the rest of the installation. But sometimes you, you want to um, check the output before continuing on. So checking for a pattern or making sure um, that there's no error messages, for example, some commands always exit with zero and you may, be, you may need to be a little bit careful with checking that it, it didn't fall over halfway. Um, so if you need to do that, you can do that by grabbing the output from the command, grabbing the exit code from the command and then checking that yourself if you're not happy with what EasyBuild does by default. You can also tell it to run the command in a, in a specific directory rather than just in a current directory uh, and so on. And then additionally for the, the interactive um, commands, there's options available there as well to ignore questions or ignore output that sits there for a while that may look like a question to easy build, but it's actually not. Uh, so there's a lot of details there as well. For Manipulating environment variables in the built environment, you can just use the, the standard OS Environ um, Python mechanism or os.setenv. Uh, uh, that will work, but then EasyBuild will, will not lock those or, or will not report that when doing extended dry run, for example. So it's better to use the setvar function that EasyBuild provides in the tools.environment module because then EasyBuild will keep track of which environment variables are being set. It will report on them and extend the dry run and so on. So using the EasyBuild mechanism for manipulating the environment is recommended. And then logging and errors. Um, 
in your easy block, you can also emit your own log messages if you want to um, inform um, the user about what's going on or how far you have progressed or whether a, a particular decision was made to go left or right in the easy block. Um, you can emit a log message as well. For this, you can use the self.log um, instance that's already available to each easy block. So you don't have to set up a logger yourself. You can just use what is there. Um, with self-log info, you will emit an info log message with self-log debug. You will emit a debug log message, which is only included in the log file if EB has been configured to run in debug mode. Uh, you can emit warnings as well, which pop up a little bit better uh, in the log files um, if that's worth doing. And if something goes horribly wrong, wrong and you want to give up the installation halfway, you can raise an easy build error. And then this will result in easy build reporting the error to, on the command line and uh, giving up the installation uh, as we've seen before. So an easy or a quick example of that is that you do the necessary imports to uh, be able to raise an error and to run a command. Uh, we run the command here and we take the output. So the output and the exit code, and we make sure that the word success and all capitals appears in the output. If it does, then we log in a message, a log message and we say, okay, this looks great. The command seems to have executed correctly. If not, we raise an error and we say success was not there. So something has to be very wrong. I will just give up here. And then the sanity check, this is often included in the easy block as well, um, especially in software specific easy blocks. We typically have a custom sanity check that says these files, these directories have to be there and these commands have to be run. So this looks very close to what you can do in an easy config file as well. Um, but if it's always the same for a particular software package, you might as well do it in the easy block. So you don't have to do this in the easy config file. So this is how you can do that. And worth mentioning here is the sanity check that's specified in the easy block is a, a default or a fallback. You can still overrule this in the easy config file. So if you have sanity check paths in the easy config file and the easy block specifies them as well, the ones in the easy config file will actually be used and not the ones in the easy block. And you can tell um, easy builds to not overwrite them, but use both at the same time as well. There's a way of doing that. So sometimes you need to, if you configure the software differently, maybe you need to run a different command um, and you can specify that in the, in the easy config file by means of exception, rather than using what the easy block does by default. And then version checks, um, you may have to use in an easy block as well. If you need to do something different based on the software version, um, you can do that with these version checks. Typically that's done through the loose version um, class, I guess that's provided by uh, Python itself. So that's uh, just to make sure you're, if you're comparing versions that's done correctly and not by alphabetical sorting. Um, so here, the name of the bin file has changed for old and new versions of the software. Um, so we added this condition in here. And then the last thing is the, the additional remark um, in terms of using class variables, you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, yeah, so if you're doing a dry run, db-x or extended dry run, um, you have to take into account in the easy block that if you specify to run a command that in dry run mode, the command will not actually be run, but easy build will try to continue and report what the easy block is doing. So that means um, even though you expect output to be here, it may not be there when in dry run mode. And in that case, you probably don't want to raise an error, but you want to say, okay, we're in dry run mode. So there's no output, but that's actually fine. I'll just continue and pretend everything is okay. So this is an, an updated version of the example above where we check for success and the output. If it's not there, so this else, and we're in dry run mode, then we, then we say, okay, the pattern is not there, but we're in dry run mode. So I'm just gonna ignore that and continue. And if we're not in dry run mode, only then we erase the error. 
So that's an easy block that's aware of the extended dry run uh, mechanism. And somewhat similarly, um, if you're doing a module only installation, so EB dash dash module only, you're skipping a lot of the steps. Configure, build, install are just skipped and the code is not executed at all. Um, and it may be important that your easy block is aware of that as well. Um, so this has an example where we have a class variable self.command, which is initially set to none. Um, and eventually this will become a command that we will uh, run in the sanity check, uh, which we also have to specify in uh, the configure um, command. So here we have a separate method, which is fully custom to this easy block. It's not a standard one uh, where we say the command that we should execute is the name of the software plus a dash plus the name of the compiler. So this will be different based on the tool chain that we use. Um, and we call the set command method here before we define the additional configure option. And then we reuse that self.command in the sanity check to make sure that this command is actually working uh, after the installation. The reason we have to be careful here is that this configure step will not be run when we do a module only um, EB run, which means this set command will not be run. So this will still be none when we run the sanity check. So that's why we have the separate part here. If the command is still none, then we make sure that the command is set before we continue with the actual sanity check. So sometimes you have to be a little bit more careful in your easy block if you want it to be compatible with module only. Yeah, is there a question? No, okay, I heard somebody enable his mic. Um, okay, so that's a lot of information. Um, I think the examples are, are hopefully helpful. But to make this a little bit more concrete, let's maybe work our way through the first exercise um, together. And then I can leave the second exercise for yourself, which is building on the first one. And you actually get the full answer here in the, in the solution box. But let me try to build this up um, gradually to give you a feeling of how that's done, how to implement um, an easy block from scratch. So before we begin, so, can I can I ask a yes. general question? So, um, sure. I, I I haven't programmed this easy blocks before; just worked with easy config. So, I, I imagine that in in practice, when you look around in these easy blocks, there is a certain programming style or or best practices and so on how you do things. And you've shown a, a few tips and tricks here now, you know, smart things to do in an easy block and so on. So is, is there any cook, cookbook available with examples or are there specific easy blocks which you would recommend that you would check the, the ones you have written, for example, or yeah. From where should one copy paste the code to make the easy blocks? Because I think that's what happens in practice a lot, right? can't hear you. And if we don't hear you anymore, you may have problems with your internet connection. No, maybe it's a Bluetooth. Is it better now? Yeah. It's very silent. Mm -hmm. Very low voice. I think it's my headphones acting up again. Yeah. Let me see if I can fix that. Is it better now? Yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah. My headphones die every now and then. I have no idea why. Um, so the question was uh, best practices. OK. Um, I think it's a difficult question to answer in general. The, the things I mentioned here are general best practices. Um, and if you're looking for examples of how to do a particular thing, I, I would say the search the search option in GitHub is your, is your best way of um, of finding something or asking around in the easy build Slack, for example. The, the, the issue is that the answer you may be looking for depends a lot on what exactly you want to do. So if you want to 
we want to run the shell command and do something in addition, like checking the output or uh, interactive commands, or that there's, there's different easy blocks that do interactive commands, for example, but also in different ways, depending on how long ago they, will, they were implemented. Like in, in Wharf, the Wharf easy block, for example, I know has an interactive configure command, but that was one of the ver very first easy blocks that we wrote. Um, so there's probably other ones that do things in, in a smarter way or in a better way. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's difficult to answer. And if you can't easily find what you're after, um, asking around in the easy build Slack is probably the, the best way. There's probably people there that are certainly the easy build maintainers that are well aware of what's out there. And if you ask a specific question, it will ring a bell for them and say, okay, for example, look at subread because that looks quite similar to, to what you want to do. Okay, so, so that, there, that, there are no specific coding styles and guidelines which are enforced in order to get it accepted upstream, or so is the format quite free, so to speak? The, the coding style itself is, is um, there's actually uh, style checks in the, in the CI that we have in the EasyBlocks repository. So you, there are certain things you, that the test that will make make the test fail or make the bot yell at you. Um, but in, in other than standard PEP8 compliance, so that's a, a standard Python coding style, not really. We when we do the review of uh, of pull requests, we will probably uh, make specific remarks like, okay, if you do it like this, it may work, but then. For example, it's not, not going to be compatible with module only, and this is how you could fix that. So it, it's more of a back and forth, I think, during the review, mm. um, where, where somebody who's more, more familiar than how easy blocks work or how it may affect other things um, that tries to help you out there. I'm just asking because, you know, in, the, in some projects, there, there might be very strict requirements and there might be a, a guide that you're supposed to write the code in this way and do these kind of things in order to, you know. No, okay. no, yeah, no not really. We don't have very strict things like this. Uh, basically, when when the, the CI tests are happy and the installation works, unless we have a particular reason like incompatibility with module only, it will probably be OK. Um, so so it's not like we're going we're gonna to force you to write declarative code or, or anything like this. Um, but what we will do is if, if we see you doing something that we know there's a, there's a function for in the easy build framework, we'll probably tell you, yeah, it's probably better to use the easy build framework function because it has side effects like logging or extended dry run reporting or things like this. So, it, but other than that, I don't think we have anything very, very strict. Okay, if there's no more questions, let me try and to finish this example, um, I'll make sure I have a clean environment here. So I'll just log in again and do the basic setup again. So load easy build and do the basic configuration. So the, the purpose of the exercise is writing a custom easy block for EB tutorial. So the, the one that we wrote an easy config file first we're going to try and implement an easy block for that and minimize the easy config file as much as we can. So I think I named it example here. Yeah, so this one we're going to try and clean up. There's a couple of things we're, we want to get rid of here, mainly the configure option. Um, so we don't want to do it like this uh, because yeah, this is CMake specific and we don't want to have CMake specific stuff in here in case EV tutorial um, for some reason, things it's not a good idea to stick with CMIC and move to something else. We want to make this a bit more generic. And the sanity check, of course, we can do this fully in the easy block, and then the easy config file doesn't have to worry about it anymore. And we don't want to use the generic um, CMIC make easy block for whatever reason. We're not happy with it. So the purpose of the exercise is to write to implement a new easy block that starts from the base easy block class. So basically starting from scratch. Um, the second exercise is then to do the do this again, but starting from the CMake make easy block, which actually makes more sense rather than redoing everything ourselves. But for the purpose of the exercise, um, it's okay to start from scratch. 
So let's try doing that. Um, first of all, the naming of the easy block, it's EB, the software name is EB dash tutorial. So the name of the easy block will have to be EB underscore tutorial dot pi. So again, you can ask this function here, get module path. Actually, let me do that to show you. I'll do it with Python 3. Do the import and then get module path eb tutorial. So this is the name of the Python file. And of course, you have to add .py to that. And the name of the class, similar, but a different function. So in code class name will tell us that we need to do, no, if we don't have typos at least. So we start with EB underscore in capitals and then a software name where we replace the dash with underscore minus underscore. So EB tutorial dot pi. The name of the class we're going to directly derive from easy block and let's do pass here to make it an empty class and of course we need the import statement as well so the easy block class is defined in the easy block module that sits in the easy block framework so this is a very stupid um, easy block that won't do much well, we, we can already try using it. Before we do that, we have to change um, the easy config file. Let me copy it so I can show the difference with the other one. So I'll use the second one. So we want to get rid of this easy block statement. So easy build to try to find the software specific easy block for EB tutorial. We just try it like this, it will still fail because EasyBuild doesn't know the location of this custom easy block, but we can tell it to pick up on that using include easy blocks. And we just give it the name of the Python file. This supports some um, um, wildcards as well. So you can actually do dash, uh, sorry, star.py here as well if you only have um, easy block. Python files in the current directory that will work too. So that will pick up, um, clean up the output a bit. That will pick up our custom easy block and try to use it. In this case, it already sees the module, so I have to force it to do a rebuild. And it will now try to do the installation with this custom easy block that will fail pretty hard because we haven't implemented the configure step. So it says, I found the non-implemented error as soon as I was hitting configure. So everything else up until the configure step is done by the easy build framework. So downloading, setting up the build environment, unpacking the source files, all of that is done automatically. So we don't have to do that ourselves. We leverage that functionality from the easy build framework from the standard easy block. But the standard easy block does not implement any configure. Um, command. It doesn't make any decisions towards what the, what a standard installation procedure is. In, in my view, it, it doesn't really exist. So the first step will be to define a configure step. So we define a method like this. Um, and we'll have to, what did the exercise say? Run this CMA command. So we'll do run command basically of CMake, which means we do it. need an additional import tools that run import run command. Um, we can try this, but of course, th this will need some options. So first of all, here it says you need to specify the installation directory. So we'll need to give it CMake install prefix as an option. CMake install prefix equals something. I'll use Python templating to inject the actual location of the installation directory here. And we'll also need to provide our required um, EB tutorial message configuration option, which um, 
I can already do it here. EB tutorial message without this underscore. And we'll give a value here. Now this looks a bit, this is getting a bit long. So in terms of code style, uh, we'll break this up and we'll compose this command based on the list of values. So here we're already formatting things a bit to make it look nice for humans and to make sure we pass the standard Python code style. And if we have made any typos, this looks okay. So this will be the different parts of the CMake command that we will execute. We will join that list with the space as a separator. So we get one long string. Now this template value, we of course have to replace with the location of the installation directory. There's an, a variable we can use for that that's defined for every easy block self.install there. So this is set up by the easy framework and it will contain the value of the install there um, actually very early on certainly by the configure step that will be already in place um, and this eb tutorial message here the value here we need to um, somehow grab from the easy config file so for this we will need a way to communicate the string we want to use to the easy block so that sounds like a custom easy config parameter that we'll define. If you want to access easy config parameters, we'll use self.config and let's call this message. So that's not an existing easy config parameter. We'll have to define this one ourselves. And for this, we use the extra options method. That's a static method. That's a bit of a special case. And what the extra message, extra options does, it returns, uh, what is it, a dictionary? I have to think about this myself. Yeah, it returns a dictionary of additional configure options. So in this case, it's message. And the value we have to use here is a list with the default value. There's no default value. Um, a help message here, which I won't care about. I will make this a mandatory easy config parameter since this has to be there for the installation to work, which means we need an extra import for this mandatory constant. Like this. So dum -dum 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 -dum. this looks okay. We have a custom easy config parameter, which we use in the CMA command to pass it to the configure option here. And we also specify the location where we want to have the software installed. So let's take this for a spin already. Let's just use the existing easy config file, which won't make sense. And we have a typo, line 18. I'm missing a brace here to close the run command. Try this again. So here it says mandatory parameter is not provided in our easy config file message. So it's picking up on the custom parameter that's mandatory. And indeed our example easy config file doesn't define it. It still does this, uh, which doesn't make sense anymore. First of all, because we're totally ignoring config opts in our current easy block, which is probably also something we want to fix. Uh, but now we have our custom uh, message easy config parameter, so we can use this instead. And let me comment this out. Uh, yeah, it's not really needed to comment it out. It won't have any effect, but it's irrelevant at this point. So now we've added the message parameter, which is mandatory, and now it should be happy. Let me do that again with dash dash trace. So we see what's being run in the configure step. And indeed we're running CMake, we're running, we're giving it the CMake install prefix option. The framework has injected this value as the location where the software should be installed. And we're picking up EB tutorial message and the value here. And here we already see, this doesn't look very good because our value has spaces. 
and we're not properly passing this down. So that's that's not going to end well. Uh, and probably if we look into the log file, CMake will already tell us it's not very really happy with that. Uh, it's missing the source directory. Oh yeah, okay. Um, so it's it's trying to run this command and it's assuming that the last argument it sees tutorial is the name of the directory where the steaming command should be run. So that's why it says source directory yada yada slash tutorial does not exist. Okay, so this is a bit of a weird way of how the uh, value with spaces is manifesting. We can fix that in our easy block by making sure we wrap this in single quotes. So the message can contain spaces, so we have to be a bit careful. If we try this again, the CMake will probably succeed. So it was running the CMake command. This has exited with zero. This looks okay. Then it tries to proceed to the build command where we again hit the non-implemented error which makes sense. We haven't implemented the build step yet. So the very basic way of implementing the build step is run command make. And we might as well do the install step as well. While we're at it, run command make install. Now here, of course, I'm ignoring a whole bunch of things. Uh, we're not running make in parallel. Um, like the CMake make easy block would do. We're ignoring things like built opts and pre-built opts, which is not a very good practice as well. So in terms of Peter's question, like are there best practices? Making your easy block aware of pre-built opts and built opts is, is one of the things you should probably pay attention to. Um, so that will definitely pop that will definitely pop up in a in a review of a, a pull request. Try this again. Is there an, a question or Um, okay, this seems to work. So it's doing the make, it's doing the make install. Um, that's working fine. It's doing the sanity check using the information we have in our easy config file. So this stuff, that still works. That looks okay. And now the last bit, I guess, for the easy block is to push this into the easy block itself so we can clean it up in the easy config file. Let me open both. So this part we want to move into here. And the sanity check step. Sanity check step. Um, and here we want to define, let me just grab it from here. The names of the variables don't really matter. So we can define both the paths and the commands here, but we have to pass this down to the actual sanity check. So here in build step and install step, all we really needed to do was run a command and then that step is complete. Here in the sanity check, we want to specify what to check for. And then the actual check, we can just divert to uh, easy build framework. So we can call the, the parent uh, method essentially. So, here we need to give it this super call and say we want to call the sanity check of the parent. And then we have to pass down uh, um, these things, of course. So custom paths is the list of paths we want to check for. And custom commands. So this custom paths and custom commands, you will see these in the API documentation of the easy block. If you check sanity check step, you will see that it takes this and this as uh, options when calling it. So we're just passing down these two to the parent. So the standard implementation of the sanity check. So as you can tell, we don't actually have to customize the sanity check step ourselves, as long as the easy config file gives us the necessary information, the framework can do that for us. But in this case, we wanna take control and uh, do it in the easy block, which means we can remove this from the easy config file here. Let me kick out this one as well. 
um, and have a minimal easy config file and divert as much as we can to the easy block. So now we've cleaned up the sanity check in the easy config file, we've added it to the easy block. And if I haven't made any typos, that should work. So we can do another rebuild using the easy block and the cleaned up easy config file. And we can see that it's still doing the same check, but it's now coming from the easy config file. And to show you if we want to check for something else, um, if we want, if we're not happy with what's being done by the easy block, we can do it in here. So we can only customize, uh, let's say echo hello, which doesn't make sense. The, the very stupid sanity check to run. But if we want to customize it, we can do it in the easy config file. And then what's specified in the easy block will be ignored. It will only run the echo hello, but it will still check for the paths that are specified by the easy block. Um, I think that's basically the exercise unless I've, yeah, I skipped part of it. So I'm, I'm not picking up on things like config ops or pre-install ops that's shown here in the solution. Um, so if you want to be a little bit more careful, you want to make sure that the configure step picks up on pre-config ops, picks up on config ops and same for build and install. It takes into account these rather than just blatantly ignoring what the easy config file uh, gives it. And we can take this a step further. We can make sure we build in parallel, but then we're gradually going towards what, what CMake make does by default. So it's better to leverage um, that generic easy block. And that's exactly what the second exercise does. So that says uh, implement an easy block for EB tutorial, but start from CMake make and only implement what you really have to. Um, so that probably means we won't have to do a build or install step ourselves since what CMake make provides should work just fine. That's what I had in mind for today. We skipped over the exercises a bit, but other than that, we've uh, covered everything I had in mind. Any additional questions? The, the sanity checks you have now in the example um, or exercise, they're, they're just because of the, to, to have an um, example there, that you would not have such sanity checks, right? I mean, not, not this particular type where you- This one. Yeah, I mean, I mean you, you're asking for a specific um, uh, file uh, there to, to be available. Oh, that's, really that's actually, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good thing to check for. So yeah, if, sure, sure. if I mean, install I, software- In general, I understand, but just, I mean, this, this, this sounds a bit artificial, this example. So, I mean, if you make an easy block, you would expect that you have uh, multiple easy configs there, and then you sort of, you have different um, uh, uh, binaries you install. So why do you check for a specific uh, binary? That That's my question. I mean, and- Compared to having this, is that the question? Why, why not check for just the bin directory and why check for specific commands? Yeah, but well, why do you it, check for specific commands? Is it, that an example? It, well, no, it's actually, I think it's, it's a good idea to do that because you, you're looking for specific commands that you want to use the software with. So just, sure. just, checking, okay. for, just checking for a non-empty bin directory, who knows what's in there? Maybe there's a readme sure. file there. This I understand. And then that's, yes. I would expect that the name of the uh, uh, command is different for different uh, easy configs, so for different uh, software packages to install. Is, is that not the case? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that that's just I guess the the example that's a bit stupid here, but okay, okay. Then uh, sorry. The, <laughs> sorry, sorry. The, the name of the command here happens to match with the name of the software. Yeah. Okay. But it, okay. of course, you could have multiple binaries, or you sure. you often check for for library files here as well, mm. like lib lib. Uh, example.so or whatever. Yeah. So this, yeah. And there's there's a bit of a balance between a very specific sanity check and one that's good enough. So if you have an installation that gives you a hundred commands, I don't think you want to run or check for all those hundred commands and also try running them with dash dash help. Pick a couple yeah. ones 
the ones that are mentioned in the documentation or yeah whatever but yeah uh, i think i understand the so the question is maybe more okay uh, in that easy block i would expect things to be checked for which are common for all possible easy configs uh, which use this uh, easy block right mm -hmm. uh, in, in this case it makes sense to check for eb tutorial because we're we're implementing an easy block specifically for installing eb tutorial okay it's not a generic it's not a generic okay. easy block okay okay then yeah. I understand. But, mm -hmm. For C for C make make of course there's there's no custom sanity check for C make make okay. because it, ah, okay. you wouldn't know what you wouldn't know what to check for. For Python package on on the other hand, which is a generic easy block for installing Python packages, that one will always check for um, lib slash Python slash site packages mm -hmm. because that always mm -hmm. has to be there when installing a Python package, or it will always do an import check. So Python import example because it knows if you're installing a Python package. In Python package, usually the import check should, should work then. There's exceptions, but as a standard way of checking something, that makes sense. But for CMake make or configure make, I wouldn't know mm -hmm. what to check for. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Any additional questions? So again, for next week, this is roughly what I have in mind. Um, the custom tool chains may be a bit difficult um, and we'll definitely get back to that when, when doing the Cray um, part, so the last one. Um, and I, I do plan to show some stuff here about the GitHub integration as well. But if, the, if there are specific things people wanna hear more about, um, definitely mention it, I'll, I'll prepare that by next week. So feel free to reach out through the rocket chat or just fire me an email if there's something specific you want to hear about. And if not, I think we can wrap it up here. Sure.